this uh, theta function, if you move to complex plane, is a modular form of weight, is an elliptic modular form of weight eight. And then I set that up, there's essentially one up to scale and we computed the scale, the scale was one. So as a result, we could show that these two lattices are isolated. But now in general, um, so uh, what are these guys? So a holomorphic function. So this is kind of definition. A holomorphic function. From the so this is this is our notation for upper half plane to C is called. A modular form of weight K. So this K is an integer for us. So it means we are just looking at uh, integral modular forms belonging to Z. If F of a Z plus D over CZ plus D is equal to CZ plus D to the power of K F of Z. So um, this is for um, uh, all uh, integral uh, in modular matrices for all A, B, C, D belonging to S, L, Q, Z, right? And remember, this is, of course, the set of all um, A, B, C, Ds such that A, B, C, D are integers and A, D minus B, C is equal to one. And this is a subgroup of SL2R. Remember, we introduced SL2R um, uh, last lecture or a couple of lectures ago. So we showed that this group actually acts on the upper half plane. So, um, okay, so, uh, well, this is a subgroup of. Uh, SL2R. In fact, uh, so let me finish the definition first of all, and then I'll make some comments. And uh, so this uh, next condition is also important, and F uh, is holomorphic. At infinity. So in this definition, I think everything is very clear, uh, except this condition of holomorphic at infinity. And I will tell you what exactly this means. Uh, so basically it means that as you go uh, up, this is your upper half plane, and this is your function F to C, holomorphic, the boundary is excluded. As you go up to infinity, this holomorphicity uh, tells you that this function has a limit as you go to infinity. So it doesn't blow up, not only as has a limit. So I will uh, precisely define it in a second, but that's the idea of holomorphism. So this is the behavior at infinity. And this is this uh, modular uh, behavior. Um, so K is, is fixed. Uh, it de de defines the type of uh, modular form. Now, uh, this group, of course, SL2Z uh, inside, so this is the end of definition. Now, some comments uh, here. So this SL2Z inside SL2R, first of all, you notice this is a discrete uh, subgroup. Well, discrete means that for any element, there exists a neighborhood there which doesn't contain any other element of that subset, which is the case because everything is an integer. So, 
and we are in R, SL2R. So it's a discrete uh, subgroup, so it's discrete. And the way you should think about it is uh, that it's some kind of non-abelian non analog of the way, for example, Z sits inside R, or actually Z2 sits inside R2. So this is uh, non-abelian. analog of of um, say z2 inside r2 so it's 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 a non abelian lattice in some sense so so to z is some sort of lattice which is there discrete sub subgroup and this is the case that is I mean, here you remember we divide R2 by Z2, we divide it. And so you get torus, right? And in fact, uh, you can divide by any lattice, as we did by gamma, and you get this flat tori. Here also, uh, there is a similar thing, but here I don't want to divide SL2R by SL2Z. I want to divide the set that it acts on it by SL2Z, and then you will get uh, a surface which is called uh, modular uh, surface. So, so, so let me write it. Uh, so if you want H divided by the action of SL2Z, So this is a surface in algebraic geometry. This is called curve because for them curve is a complex curve. So it's a two dimensional uh, real dimension, but one dimensional complex. No matter how you call it, it's called modular surface or modular curve. So it has, uh, it's non-compact. First of all, and uh, this guy is, uh, has two conical singularities. So we will get to that soon. With two conical singularities. Okay. So this is for us, and this is called the modular surface or modular curve. So this is for us is some sort of non-abelian version of this. And the simplest case of action of uh, upper half plane by a discrete subgroup of SL2R, which in this case we just said. So we will see some exam more examples of this, but already this is quite, quite interesting. So I will, we will get to that, but just, idea that what is going on. So, uh, so now let's just look at this, um, this condition, or what does it, it mean? What does it mean uh, is the following. So I think uh, one thing to notice uh, is, is to notice some particular elements here. So there is, uh, there are two trans, of course, I mean, we have this Mobius transformation. So one of them is S of Z, is equal to minus one over z. This belongs to SL two z, right? And the other one is a shift t of z equal to z plus one. This also belongs to SL two z. So you have these two uh, transformations. So of course you can write the matrix of S in terms of by two matrices easily and the same with T. Now, uh, the thing that uh, to, to, to remember about these two transformations is that, of course, one of them is shifting its right translation by one, right? This is a, a T. The other one is kind of more interesting. It's uh, it's uh, reflecting on the unit circle. So if you have a point 
you find uh, a point which is, is product of the distances is one, and then you have to do this uh, complex conjugation, and then uh, you have to do minus one. So, so S of Z, if you want, is equal to minus Z bar over absolute value of Z squared. So this is a more interesting operation, but both of them are there. So the first thing to notice is the following uh, fact. I give you as an exercise, there are different proofs, and what I want you to think about it. Um, so, exercise is um, show that SL2Z is generated. As a group by these two elements S and T. S and T. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice exercise. I highly recommend you try doing it. We can try either algebraic way of doing it or geometric, there are different ways, but both of them are quite interesting. Uh, so a consequence of this, uh, of this exercise is that a function is uh, modular of, uh, is a modular form of weight K, so corollary is that, uh, F is a modular form of weight K. You can only if you have these two properties that, of course, holomorphicity and holomorphicity at infinity is assumed, is that uh, those modular properties is equivalent to this F of Z plus one is equal to f of z and f of one over z is equal to, um, so the condition in terms of s can be written by, by z to the power k f of z minus one over z equal to z to the power k um, f of z. So um, some sort of functional equation should be satisfied. Question? Yes. Um, so first, the way you write this S and T, yes. uh, you write, you regard them as transformations of upper half plane. So perhaps we are talking about PSL2, in fact. Uh, no, uh, I am uh, talking about SL2Z because SL2Z and SL2R, as we discussed, they are acting on the upper half plane. The reason we divided by, P, uh, by the center, as, as I said before, was that we wanted to get exact equality of isometry group, be it this group, but by them, they just act. No, I mean, I don't have to take that, yeah. Uh, okay, and I'm looking at the, the definition of a modular form and one thing, so that, does this k have to be even? Well, this is a result that you have to prove, yeah. I will, I'm going to say that, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank it's, you. It's, it's, it's forced to take k equal to even. This is, a, this is an exercise I will, I will give you in a second, yeah. Uh, I have one question. Uh, okay. Doesn't uh, SL2Z, they have like um, four entries and then there's one equation that you have to satisfy. So why are there two generators? Uh, those uh, generators uh, are discrete generators. I mean, they are like A, B, C, D. I mean, they are not real. They are not real parameters. 
they are uh, they are discrete they are integers and as you know a group for example uh, can be infinite group in this case this is also an infinite group has two generators has three generators could have n generators there's nothing to stop you from you take free group for example of five generators and then it has five generators it's an infinite group there's no condition even so your argument is not uh, i'm not sure what what you mean uh, I mean, I, I was thinking that since you have three entries and then one equation, so there should be, I'm oh, sorry, four entries and one equation, there should be three degrees of freedom. No, this is uh, for case of continuous variables. These are discrete variables. Uh, so the idea of continuous, uh, the idea of degrees of freedom is irrelevant in this case. Okay. This, these are discrete groups, you see. You have to, they have their own character. I mean, they have their own world. So you cannot uh, easily understand them in terms of, uh, and this is a discrete uh, subgroup of this, this three-dimensional manifold, SL2R indeed, yes. Okay. But you cannot uh, say, yeah. But anyhow, these are these two generators. These are two generators. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I have one, actually two questions, please, Masood. Okay. So are these functions the same as holomorphic functions on Poincaré disk that have radial limits when you get close to boundary? Well, I mean, these functions are on, uh, on the Poincaré uh, upper half plane for sure. Oh, you mean in the disk model? Yes. Okay, in the disk model, you can write down these, uh, these things, but I really don't know what, you mean radial limit? No, no, they don't have radial. No, I mean, no, radial limit is not, it's not sufficient. This is, this is, has a very, very kind of rigid uh, structure, which is this modularity property. So you see, these two things are quite a strong conditions. So you must, you must make sure to write these conditions in the Poincaré model, uh, pic, in the Poincaré disk picture. You can, I mean, but, uh, that's not very useful, actually. Okay. And the second question I have is, yes. so we, uh, you have been talking about SL2Z whenever you talked about uh, upper half uh, model, but there is, a, yes, uh, but there is another action, which is by isotropy group, that one fixes one point, actually it doesn't differentiate ideal points i mean sure. here you get can you formulate your, I mean, your, your question more precisely i mean well uh is a tropic group of isometries of upper half plane for for n dimension can be regarded as all, all of n minus one uh, say it again, can be regarded as? Hi hyperbolic, n-dimensional uh, hyperbolic space. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen that actually the behavior of all uh, orthogonal group of n minus one, 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 one dimension less. Yeah. That one has a better behavior. I, I mean, why this SL2 is natural? Why, why that one doesn't work better? Because that one doesn't, this one you get two singularities, but that one takes the boundary R, which is one point in, uh, at infinity, R is one point, right? That one, well, Do you know what I'm saying? No, I'm not sure. So you see, you, you can, I mean, there are different questions one can, one can ask and there are different solutions. The situation here, as I explained last time, is that you're looking at this L2R because this is the group of isometries of, uh, I mean, orientation preserving isometries of upper half plane. In that case, PSL2R is the, is the group to be more precise. And PSL to Z is this uh, discrete subgroup, or SL to Z is discrete subgroup of SL to R. And uh, these uh, transformation properties, uh, 
uh, are suggested uh, from study of uh, theta functions and Eisenstein series and this is, so you have to know something about them before you cannot just uh, you know get into this right away this it takes time so you should just uh, follow the the thing and then see uh, see what is what is happening right okay thank you yeah yeah sure but i mean okay so this is uh, so far i just gave a definition and uh, this definition uh, so the best question is what is the meaning of this definition <laughs> That that that's not very easy to answer. So that's uh, that takes time. So, uh, but we will get to that. Okay. But now, actually, we are going to go to puncture this. Uh, so there is this so-called Jacobi parameterization. Or Jacobi parameter, this is Q is equal to e to the two pi i z. And I really want two here. Yes. So this Jacobi parameter, what it does is uh, is taking upper half plane to the punctured disk. Right? So this is um, here. So this is a Z, sometimes it's also called the tau. This is called the modular parameter. And by this Q, I mean, this is also written as e to the two pi i tau. I mean, notation in this business is very, very important. So I'm just introducing different notations, but uh, so anyhow, by Q, if you look at this upper half plane by this map, you are coming to unit zero. So this is the Q, Q space, or Jacobi's uh, disk, I call it. So zero is um, deleted because zero corresponds to point at infinity. So as, as you go further up, you come closer and closer to zero, and this line corresponds to this boundary. They are excluded. Okay? So now, if you have a function which is of this form, this implies that f can be expressed as, you can write it in this q parameter as, uh, so I just, use uh, f tilde, but it really is the same function, but written in this coordinate now, so f tilde of q. So look, I mean, this is a holomorphic function on the puncture disk, so you can write it as just this, just this condition, and holomorphicity says that this can be written as sigma a n, q n, n from minus infinity to plus infinity. There is a Laurent expansion. So this is also called Q expansion. That's very important. Now, what this uh, holomorphicity at infinity means, means that all these coefficients uh, below zero are zero. And so F holomorphic, so now I'm giving you a precise definition if you want holomorphic at infinity really means that a I equal to zero for I is less than zero. Okay, so in other words, the field of Q is sum of a n, Q n, and from zero up to infinity. Okay, so this, uh, okay, I mean, so we have written it like this, but basically it means that if you have a Laurent uh, series, uh, this condition of vanishing holds if and only the function is bounded near zero, then it means that it's holomorphic automatically. That's why, so it's bounded at infinity. That's why I said that holomorphicity at infinity is the same as boundedness at infinity. So that's, uh, that's one thing. And then uh, there is a further condition is that um, 
Of course, uh, this is called cusp form. F is a cusp form. It's for in German, uh, if um, a zero is also equal to zero. So this, even the value at zero is equal to zero. So it starts at terms of order one, infinity. Uh, but this condition, I did not tell you anything, uh, what it means in terms of this coefficient a n. They have to be satisfied some conditions in order you have this condition also. Okay, so this is uh, now, okay, so it's good we had some discussion about these things, but now, um, okay, so, any questions, first of all? Okay, so we define cusp forms, we define modular forms of bait K, cusp forms of bait K, and we have this Jacobi parameterization uh, here. And then we also, okay, so wrote it like that. Now, uh, some easy things you can derive from these conditions. So I write it as an exercise now. So um, as I think it was mentioned uh, by uh, Arkadiusz, I guess, was that uh, first of all, um, for K odd, there is no, um, so, so let me introduce notation. Let M, um, so, okay, so exercise is this. One, for K less than zero, there exists no non-zero modular form. of a rate k. This you can prove uh, using basic facts from your complex analysis. The second is that for k odd, also no non-zero modular forms. I mean, we are talking about these elliptic modular forms in this case, which are in the spectrum this subgroup. There are zillions of other types which are much more complicated. But here, no non zero modular form of weight K. Okay, so then uh, there is. Um, um, some notation. So let excuse me, can, can I ask, ask a question? Uh huh, yes. Does F tilde define a function on the whole disk? F tilde, as yes. I said, originally just defines a function on the punctured disk, but then we, we insist that this function to be also extendable to the, to oh. the to disk, which means that it has to be holomorphic at zero by removable singularities theorem, that's all. So okay. then it means that it is defined, yeah. So what, okay, is, okay. Sorry. so what is the question? No, that was it. Well, I mean, didn't I tell you already that that's the case? <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, two, so we have this, so now let, Okay, so now let uh, MK be a space of, so this is a C linear space of modular forms. Of weight 2K. So then uh, we define this M to be the sum 
of mk, k say bigger than or equal to zero. So this is space, this uh, vector space n, which is direct sums of all these modular forms, is actually a ring because you can, it's a graded ring. You can check that products of modular forms is again modular forms and the weights add. So it's a graded ring. Ring. So, uh, so it means mk times mk prime is inside mk plus k prime. That's obvious. From the definition, if you write down the definition, this becomes obvious. Uh, you will see that that's clear. Okay, so then what? Uh, what what is known is that, and I use part of this fact by the way. So you can check uh, Sarah's book. Uh, the fact is that for k equal to zero, two, three. Four, five, and k is a vector space of dimension one. With basis can also, uh, there are different ways of talking about basis in this space. Here is one with basis one uh, G um, G two uh, G three uh, G four and G five. So G is for Eisenstein series. I will define them. Eisenstein um, series or uh, function. Okay. So um, not only we, so I use this information for four. Because we got, uh, I believe, modular form of bait eight, two modular forms of bait eight, and we argue that, yeah, because of this result, space is one dimensional, so they have to be, um, they have to be um, the same up to scale, and then we computed the scale. The scale came out to be one, and so on. So, but now we can also not only this. There is uh, more information you can also, you can, you, you, you can tell the structure of this ring. So um, also, structure of ring is this, um, the ring um, M, as I wrote over there, direct sum MK, if you then go to zero, um, um, is isomorphic to polynomial ring um, C of X and Y. Uh, under the map so from C of X and Y send it to C to M which is also C of G2 and G3 uh, 
Uh, so you just send x to g2 and then uh, y to g3. So this is the same as polynomial rings in, in, in polynomial, polynomial ring in two variables, except that we have changed the um, grading here. So we are declaring x has grade two and y has grade three. That's doable, that's not a problem. Um, so G2 and G3, basically that's that what this result says that they are free. I mean, obviously this ring is commutative because we are multiplying functions here. So this is commutative. So, but uh, this G2 and G3 and they products, if you write all kinds of polynomials in G2 and G3, you have created all modular forms, uh, I mean, elliptic modular forms in this sense. And uh, that's the map. So this is also, you can read in uh, the proof, you can read in Sarah's book. So what I'm going to do now is to tell you uh, what this Eisenstein series is very quickly. And also uh, how we got our, our modular forms. This was this, uh, theta series that came from lattices, and that's a, that's a very important technology. It can be applied to many, many other questions. So attaching theta series to lattices, uh, for some lattices you get modular forms. So that's, so that's, that's uh, it, it's gonna take us about maybe 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes. Uh, so do you have any questions? Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Does this uh, isomorphism from M to a polynomial ring imply that uh, G5 is a multiple of G2, G3? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, exactly. All of them, yeah, is, is, is a product of, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So everything um, in this category, uh, this type of modular form, we can construct from G2 and G2. So now that you ask uh, G2 about G2 and G3, so let me tell you what is uh, GK, the Eisenstein series. Uh, so you can write it in, in the following form. Um, Um, uh, so I'm going to do GK. GK Z is equal to um, sum. Prime, I'll tell you what prime is, M and N belonging to Z, one over MZ plus N to the power two K. So here K is equal to two, three, so on. Right? So what does this prime means, it means that we are taking an N, uh, so Z belongs to H, of course. It means that we are taking those M and N's uh, non-zero, just uh, at least one of them should be non-zero. If both of them are zero, then you are dividing by zero and that's excluded. So this basically prime means you are excluding zero in the denominator. And this k going from two, three, so on. Uh, first of all, the first thing to check, so this is a nice exercise. Check that uh, the series is absolutely uh, uniformly convergent on compact subsets of the upper half plane. That's an easy estimate. Uh, series is absolutely uniformly Convergent and compact subsets of 
H. So then this would imply that because it's a limit of holomorphic functions, if you cut at some stage, then you have finite sum is a holomorphic function. So it's a limit, uniform, absolute uniform limit da, 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 of holomorphic functions. So the result is holomorphic. Hence, GK is holomorphic. That's one thing. And second is that you have this modular property, GK uh, is a modular form. Of weight. GK. So GK Z plus one is equal to GK Z and GK minus one over Z is equal to Z to the power two K um, GK Z. You can check these conditions. Uh, from the definition, that's okay. So this is a this is a nice exercise, but uh, it gives you some sort of bearing on this problem. Uh, you can also check uh, the value of this function at infinity, because there was the question of infinity. So the value of this function at infinity is actually related to zeta function g k. I believe my notation is GK infinity in this case. Yes, GK infinity is equal to two times zeta of 2K. So the limiting uh, value at infinity is related to values of uh, zeta function at uh, 2K. Of course, zeta S. Famous Riemann zeta function, which we'll look at it uh, very carefully soon. This is one over n to the s, and from one to infinity, we are part of s bigger than one. So, this is uh, absolutely convergence. We will really talk about it, but okay, so this is it. Okay, so that's uh, that's for now, and then. So that's a, that's a kind of I think is enough. But but then uh, how we landed in modular forms? So we had this technique, the machine from lattices. Um, at least uh, I mean from unimodular or self-dual, even lattices. Um, we landed in uh, so um, modular forms in R, in, in say R uh, n and belonging to multiple of uh, eight. Landed in um, uh, modular forms uh, I mean we landed in of course elliptic modular forms uh, so the, 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 the thing was this we had a lattice gamma and then, then we attached to this z gamma the partition function or heat trace so the gamma of uh, tau of t first of all was a sum exponential of minus pi norm of x squared uh, t i believe and this was x belonging to um belonging to uh, uh, uh gamma because it's self dual so it doesn't matter then uh, we define from this the theta function right so we got the theta function so then change so you see if you just t to I can multiply z. In other words, if uh, by this rule we got theta gamma of z was some 
exponential minus pi i or rather pi i actually of uh, normal x squared z uh, x belonging to gamma and z now belongs to h so we did a rotation and then we landed in the right place and this this is where Poisson summation formula, you remember, this implies that theta gamma is a modular form of weight n over two, belongs to m. Uh, so let me just write it modular form. Of weight. Uh, okay, so this was like z to the power n over 2, but I want uh, this 2, so it was of weight, yeah, weight n over 2. So I'm mixing, perhaps here I'm mixing this factor of 2, because there is some confusion from beginning about twice, or if you take mk or m2k, there are different notations there, so, okay, so, but anyhow. So using this result I mentioned, and this is just uh, what we got. So, um, so, okay, so now, um, all right, so how these things are used? Well, I mean, in number theory, they, they are used day in, day out. I mean, this is where you kind of, generating series of important uh, arithmetic functions is encoded in terms of this uh, modular uh, functions and, and in terms of the Q series, and then you want to relate them to representation theory. Uh, so this is part of a very big uh, machinery. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't uh, touch it, uh, unfortunately, here, because we have other things to do. So are, are there any questions? Um, Sorry, maybe I went too fast here, but I just wanted to give you the idea, but. Um... Right, so, um, okay, so, okay, I think uh, we are good for now. So we can take a break, a quick break, and then, uh, We'll come back. So what was my plan? So the next thing I wanted to do today was, um, oh God, oh my God, what was it I wanted to do? Um, oh yes, we wanted to compute um, spectrum of uh, spheres. Uh, so that's another kind of very, very interesting topic. It's calculational and also, as some representation theory, which is very nice. So we want to see that. So um, it's, it's not an obvious thing to do. So uh, we'll do it before we move into uh, uh, heat fresh expansion. Um, a question. Yes, yes, sure. Uh, well, it, it just seems kind of strange to me that like, okay, so we, we, we have this theta gamma and it's a, uh, we, we did it for, for weight eight modular form. So uh, since, since you said that the dimension of the modular forms of weight eight is one, so it means that it must be a multiple of G2 to the power of four, uh, right? Okay, yes. Uh, so so it just seems, just seems weird to me that like uh, this, adding this bunch of exponential functions is equal to this thing, which is the sum of reciprocals of things that have no E inside them, but somehow they must be equal. Uh... Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's right. So that, that's exactly what happens. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's life. What can you do? <laughs> I mean, uh, well, if you add infinite number of things, uh, then you don't know what's the limit, right? I mean, so it's like, uh, so this is more like a philosophical point. Uh, uh, it's like uh, in maybe medieval times of people would say that, how could the sum of some rational numbers, one plus one half plus one third, but da, 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 
uh, or maybe one plus one over two squared, one over three squared, one over four squared, da, 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 and uh, ends up with something which is completely irrational. It's like pi two over six. There are zillions of examples of like that, right? I mean, by, by just looking at finite terms, we cannot say anything about the limit, right? Okay. I mean, you have in one side this, yeah, heat trace, which is sums of exponentials. And on the other side, you have this reciprocal, sums of reciprocals, and they are the same, but well, yeah. But I mean, uh, that's what happens. Like exponential function, for example, is sums of powers, but then it ends up to be this totally transcendental function, which is e to the x, right? So, I mean, I don't know, I mean, that's, uh, mm. I don't, I, does it bother you at all or maybe there is no, I, I was just wondering, maybe there's some special reason, but I, I don't think there is. They, there's just different bases kind of for, for this. Yeah, yeah, they are, that's right. They are different bases and uh, yeah, I mean, um, but the real reason is that this space of modular uh, functions uh, is uh, really finite dimensional. Yeah, by the way, I said, uh, now that we are talking again, so I said elliptic. Um, why? The reason is that you see everything we discussed was based on this fixed subgroup, right? SL2Z, right? Inside SL2R. Where there are lots of other discrete subgroups here. Lots of lots of other very, very different types of discrete subgroups. Actually, I don't think we can really say we understand all these discrete subgroups, even the most interesting ones. I don't think we, we, we really understand it. So for each of them, you have a theory of, uh, I mean, each interesting ones. For example, of course, I mean, you don't want to have some boring thing, but basically for each of them, really you have a theory of modular forms, which are called gamma modular forms, right? Because what, 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 what does it mean? It means that you have this modular property f of az plus d over cz plus d. But now we are saying that a, b, c, d should be in gamma. Right? Should be in gamma. So already uh, inside this, there are some finite index subgroups that are called gamma n. Uh, so congruence subgroups are called. And there are lots of other subgroups here. So for example, Fuchsian subgroups, so-called Fuchsian groups. Which in a way are kind of even better than that because they act without um, fixed points so that the quotient is really a smooth manifold and is a Riemann surface compact or non-compact, non -compact, but they don't have these conical singularities. And so it's, it's a zoo of subgroups here, discrete subgroups. All of them have a theory of modular form. So you see, we just looked at the most basic level of modular form and to construct uh, all those bases, to compute their dimensions, to compute the, to, to unravel the ring structures, all these things. Uh, it took uh, 150, 200 years uh, almost of work. Uh, so uh, it's a very active topic still. So that's, uh, so that's why. So elliptic uh, really means that uh, this is, uh, this corresponds to this, uh, modular curve, and the reason is that modular curve parameterizes or the modular space of elliptic curves. So this is called elliptic modular things because they kind of distinguish different elliptic curves. And elliptic curves are Riemann surfaces of genus one, for example. They are, they are different tori, but understood from the point of view of complex structure, not from the point of smooth structure. Smooth structures are e is easy. Complex structure is as moduli and the moduli is given by. So we will maybe talk about that also soon. So 
that was my comment about why we, we say these are elliptic modular forms and there are other kinds. So there is a book of Shimura you can, uh, you can, you can read where he computes, for example, dimension of different space of modular forms of, of, for this respect to different subgroups, discrete subgroups, and there are lots of very interesting things. Not all of it, just some. Okay, any other comments or questions before we take a break? So the so the yes. Muner's uh, Muner's uh, counterexample, I mean, depends on partly on the uh, you know the modular forms of uh, dimension eight or something is one oh, wait. dimensional. Yes, yes, yes. Wait, wait, wait. It's one dimensional, and uh, so so in order to make make the examples work in higher dimensions, is there any other additional difficulties? Because we, we cannot in, immediately conclude that uh, um, the, the two data functions are, are proportional to each other. Yeah, so, right. I mean, yes, in, in, for, for higher dimensional lattices, the story, and lower dimensional also, the story can get quite complicated. So for that, there is a monumental book by Sloan and Conway. It's called Lattices, Codes, and uh, what's uh, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, I think it has a three part title Lattices, Codes, and something else. So, this book of Conway and Sloan, this is John Conway, just passed away, uh, I think, a year ago or something. It's very recently. It, it, it's an amazing text. Uh, so, you can find all kinds of things about. Uh, lattices there. So I, 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 yeah, welcome reading 800 pages. Yeah, every, every page is, <laughs> yes, it's, it's fascinating, right? So yes, there is, uh, there is a lot of stuff. There. It's not, it's not a straightforward in general, so. But uh, what is interesting is that this dimension 16 that has been brought down, actually you can find uh, example, four dimensional example uh, of lattices were constructed by uh, Conway himself that are isospectral but not isometric. So that's, uh, I don't know how that proof was done actually. Yeah, so, so Milner's uh, counterexample um, is historically important because this was the first and uh, yeah, so that's what as, as any introductory course, a spectral geometry has to cover that for sure. Of course, the same with the uh, Gordon Webb Wolpert example, which was discovered much later, but that's two dimensional. Okay, any other questions or comments before we take a break? So we can take a break for five minutes and then uh, we will come back, so. Okay, so next topic is spectrum uh, around spheres. So, um, of course, spheres n is the set of all x in our n plus one. Norm is equal to one. That's what we mean. So inside our n plus one. So this is a Riemannian submanifold. It means that the metric here, Riemannian metric here, is induced from Riemannian metric in this ambient space. So this is a Riemannian submanifold. And what we want to know is what is, uh, of course, so it has some Laplacian. So Laplacian of SN, we can denote by delta of SN and Laplacian of this guy, I denote just by delta. So let's not introduce, uh, it's a standard Laplacian. Uh, let's not introduce a special condition. But for, for SN, with respect to this round metric, which is the induced metric again, it must be multiplied by this. 
So and then now the question is uh, spectrum of this guy is what? Of course, for n equal to one, we know what it is, right? We know the answer, and also eigenfunctions. I mean, uh, for n equal to one, that's the only case that we know the answer so far. Uh, so S1 for us is really R divided by, so we need a center of radius one. So this divided by two pi Z, right? And Laplacian in this case is just this periodic boundary conditions of this guy is minus again d2 dx2. I just use the same notation as on the line. And uh, okay, so in this case, uh, the spectrum of S1 are these numbers n squared n equal to 0, 1, 2, so on. So the eigenfunctions here are phi n uh, z equal to e to the two phi i n oh, x sorry phi i n x and um, phi n tilde of x is e to the minus two phi i n x. So, um, so this guy, I mean, multiplicity, so zero is a simple eigenvalue. I mean, the eigenfunction is uh, one in both cases, but then uh, n squared for n bigger than one is a, uh, is, is, is not simple as multiplicity two. Multiplicity two eigenvalue. Okay, so okay, so we know this, uh, but then if you go to S two, the question becomes already very complicated, and also uh, yeah, I mean in general um, S n also complicated. So that's what we want to do. Now it turns out that the main, well, I mean, really one of the main issues is that Laplacian uh, does not commute with restriction. So, uh, so I just say that Laplacian does not commute. with restriction. So what I mean is that if you have a smooth function here, restricted to SN, you get a smooth function on SN, compute its Laplacian, is not the same as if you take its Laplacian first and then you restrict to SN. These two operations are not the same. And you can understand that this should not be the same because Laplacian really averages the value of function around that point on, on the whole space. So when you're computing Laplacian in Rn plus one, you're averaging over n plus one directions, but then you're computing Laplacian, uh, the restricted one on, on Sn, you're averaging only with respect to neighborhood on Sn. So, and then of course, it would be a, almost a miracle, impossible that these two averaging operations be the same or differential of operations, uh, it's just one is differential in all directions essential to be the same. So that's, but there is a formula that exactly tells us how these Laplacians are related. And I will tell you this formula, I prove it at the end. So the lemma is the following. We, we, we use the lemma Lemma is this for any f belonging to C infinity of part n plus one, 
היא קומפיוט אצלו פלוסיה, ‫ריסטריקט to SN. ‫זה the same as um, computing Laplacians of this, uh, oh, sorry, of the restricted function on SN using the induced metric. So this is the notation metric on SN minus P2F PR2 minus N DF PR. This restricted to SN. And this also restricted to SN. Uh, so uh, the only thing that I have to descri describe is what is the FDR. This is the radial derivative, so to speak. Uh, which is, um, so what do you do? Yeah, so, I mean, if you want to compute the FDR, at some point X, X in Rn plus one, except zero. What you do, you connect and you study the variation of the function just along the radius, uh, the, the line that's connected to the origin. And then you go by distance r in either direction, take the difference, take the quotient by r, take the loop. This is called radial derivative. Okay, so this is the radial derivative. By the way, this proof and everything here, the best reference really is in the book. Uh, I, I, I gave this reference in my, um, in my course outline that's uh, for some stuff I'm using that. So this is Berger et al. So um, it's a great book. Uh, you have to read French, but it's French is really minimal. I mean, it's English, French. And uh, you can get by by 50 words. So I highly recommend that book. It, it's a wonderful book for an introduction to spectral geometry. So the proof of this lemma and a lot of other things, all these things, this is, is there. So, but, okay. So this is, this is, this lemma is basically our um, workhorse. That's going to be um, taking us to the goal. I mean, it's, this lemma is taking us to, to our destination with enough care and vision and uh, perseverance, of course. It's not automatic. So let's introduce some notation. So let the H. H. Uh, be a homogeneous polynomial of degree a bigger than or equal to zero. So I just write h of x1, xn plus one in n plus one variable. So we are taking f for H now, for H for F now. Uh, then, of course, H is equal to R to the K, uh, H restricted to SN, right? That's uh, this by homogeneity, you have this scaling property that you can find the value of H at any point from its values just on the round sphere by scaling by R to the power of K. This is this condition, right? Um, so from here, then you get that uh, DHDR is equal to uh, K R to the K minus one. Again, this function h restricted to SN. Of course, I mean, here everything now, this is constant, so it's not changing. So this is the change. Yes. And uh, d2 h dr2 is equal to, of course, k times k minus 1 
r to the power k minus 2 h restricted again is constant this function uh, sm so now the lemma implies that shows that uh, if you compute the Laplacian on SM uh, of this restriction of the polynomial to SM, you just get K times N plus K and minus one H restricted to SM. You see, the reason of course is that uh, um, uh, I mean, so there is here a big if. If H is harmonic, is a harmonic homogeneous polynomial. If H is a harmonic homogeneous fully, of course, of the K. Then, then you can say this. If you restrict it to SM, then you have produced an eigenfunction of uh, Laplacian with this eigenvalue k times n plus k minus one. This is clear because harmonicity means that delta of h, of course, equal to zero, right? So this function on the left hand side is equal to zero. Its restriction is zero. So this whole thing is zero, but these guys give you this sort of contributions. So now you have a uh, value of Laplacian on the restriction of this harmonic functions. Uh, restriction of har uh, harmonic functions is given by this formula, which is straightforward, right? So that's uh, what they are. Okay, so what is the lesson? Typo. Yes, yes. I think there is a typo in the Laplacian in the term with the first derivative over R, I think there should be one over R in this term. In here? No, in the next one. Yeah? Yes, I think. Uh, wait, 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 let me just check. No, I don't have one over R. Why there should be one over R, you think? The, the units should work out, right? Should be over distance squared in everything. Yeah. So also I checked uh, formula for Laplacian in spherical coordinates on Wikipedia. <laughs> no, but that's not the same thing though. Be careful. This we are not using a spherical coordinates at all. No, but if you look at the units, like everything must be in terms of distance in, per distance square, right? Okay. Isn't the R irrelevant if you're restricting to the sphere anyway? Oh, right. Yeah, but I mean, what is R? I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there is no R. There is no distance. I mean, this is, a, this is an equality of a function on, 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 on the sphere. I mean, there is no R. <laughs> That's, that was a very good comment indeed, yes. We don't need any R. No, no. I, actually, you cannot put R. It's logically wrong. Who who gave this answer, by the way? I did. Luke. Luke? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Luke. Yeah. Thanks for helping me. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I mean, we cannot put R even logically because R is not part of the equation. It's the FDR is a notation for this derivative. So, I mean, no, no. There's no R. It's and don't confuse this with uh, Laplacian in a spherical coordinates because that's a, that's a way that only works in two dimensions and it doesn't give you a big picture in n dimensions and uh, it's a it's a messy calculation. It's uh, no no no. That's, uh, that's uh, I don't want to go there. Okay, so Arkadiusz, are you happy now? It's Boaje actually, but uh, yes, I'm happy. Boaje, sorry. <laughs> So are you happy now? Yes, I'm happy. Very good, very good, thank you. Yeah, very good. So, uh, so the lesson here is that, the lesson is that 
harmonic polynomials, basically, by restricting to uh, sphere gives you eigenfunctions of the sphere. So this is a big lesson. I mean, zero eigenmodes, so zero eigenmodes uh, eigenmodes of delta on R I mean, uh, you have to be to be working with homogeneous ones. Gives you uh, eigenfunctions of uh, Laplacian on uh, S n. So let's look at uh, the case n equals to one and see what this uh, story uh, is telling us in that case. Because we know exactly everything in terms of one, in, in for n equal to one, right? So for n equal to one. So this, uh, okay, so um, now, uh, so we have this, uh, so let, so let, I mean, so we have this uh, linear harmonic functions harmonic polynomials. So these are like a x1 plus b. I mean, okay, so there's a basis, linear basis x1 and x2. They have both of them. So quadratic ones, So basically, this gives us ax1 plus bx2. Quadratic ones, these are like ax1 squared plus 2bx1 x2 plus c x2 squared. So, but the Laplacian equal to zero of this guy implies that a plus b plus c be equal to zero, so, and so on. So what the lemma says is that x1 coordinate functions, okay, so I'm gonna finish now, coordinate functions, x1 and x2, and the higher, homogeneous uh, harmonic bodies like a x1 squared plus 2b x1 x2 plus c x2 squared restricted to S1, they give us uh, eigenfunctions of Laplacian and S1. They give us uh, eigenfunctions of Laplacian. With, of course, different eigenvalues, right? I mean, uh, so this is kind of interesting because we know uh, by hand, uh, we calculated by hand these eigenvalues. Uh, and eigenfunctions for S1. So on the other, on the one hand, we have equal to two pi i x. So these are eigenfunctions of multiplicity. I mean eigenvalue, uh, eigenvalue is uh, n squared, n is bigger than equal to one in this case. But now we are saying that you can also get it by restricting these things to these polynomials to S1. So you see, it's a totally different way of looking at uh, eigenfunctions now. They are not written in trigonometric basis like exponential. And we will see that this story repeats also for S2, where the typical way of writing spherical harmonics. Uh, uh, is by writing in terms of trigonometric functions and some polynomials in trig functions. That's what usually one learns. But 
can also uh, so so now uh, our claim is that so this uh, little thing that we did here actually captures all the eigenvalues and all eigenfunctions of uh, Laplacian. So let me write the statement and then we will prove it next time. So eigenvalues of delta Sn are um, numbers lambda k equal to uh, I finish. What did we drive? We drive the k times, uh, yes, k times um, n plus k minus one. So k equal to zero, one, two, so on. So these are all the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions with eigenfunctions. Um, phi, uh, which is um, this, this belongs to a subspace of uh, so kernel of delta restricted to um, HK. So I, I don't want to use uh, HK. Yes. To, so, yeah, okay, so let, let me call it. HK because I want to be consistent with my relation. HK, so this is the space of harmonic uh, polynomials. All is uh, of uh, degree K. That's it. So you see, I mean, this space is not one dimensional. I mean, already in S, for S1, it was like two dimensional, but the dimension was constant. But if you go to S2 and S3 and higher, the dimension also increases. And the way that dimension increases is uh, by, by polynomial order. So it increases polynomially, but the eigenvalues, distinct eigenvalues, grow quadratically. This is universal. It doesn't change. Always grows quadratically. For S1, it grew like n squared. They were the eigenvalues. But for S2, S3, so on, it, grew, it grows like uh, n squared plus, uh, I mean, sorry, k squared plus some linear term, some constant term. So some linear term in k. So, so it always goes like k squared plus some linear term in k, and then so. So this is what we want to prove. I mean, so we have shown only halfway. I mean, we have shown that these guys, first of all, or just using that little lemma, right? We just show that these guys are eigenvalues, and these guys are all um, are eigenfunctions, but um, who guarantees that there are no other eigenvalues? And who guarantees that the dimension of eigenspace is not bigger than what we have got? It could be bigger. It could be that we have just got some. So it's like a miracle that by this simple lemma that just measures the degree of commutation of restriction and Laplacian operators together, uh, you can uh, get all these uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And you can write a computer program to compute it in terms of these polynomials because, you know, I'm like in this case, this is the only condition if you write, you can easily apply Laplacian to these things and you get some equations in terms of coefficients and that's it. You just solve those equations and you're 